And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and I want to welcome you all once again to the Midnight Ride. Tonight, we are very honored to have the very first interview of Nathan Reynolds' new book. It is called Snatched from the Flames, and it is indeed the true story of an Illuminati hitman. And Nathan is someone that's been on the Midnight Ride before. We've had the great privilege of uh, getting to know him and his family, uh, and we're, we really like them. We really like them and everything about them and what they do, and I'm very honored here to have this first interview, and if I don't like somebody, I don't say that. People that know me know that's the way I'm wired, but this book, it looks good. And it also reads good. It's well written. And I remember back in 1988 when Lorne Stratford's book come out, Satan's um, Underground. And at that time, we were just getting into the trenches working with satanic ritual, satanic ritual abuse. And there was so little awareness around. But after uh, Miss Stratford's book came out, pockets of light begin to spring up here and there and awareness started to grow and started to blossom people begin to understand the reality of it and come together to deal with it and this book is going to do the same thing and more for this generation this book is going to go far and many people are going to come to an awareness of the reality of things through this book and i'm just so very very thankful for that and we're going to be so thankful to get into the interview tonight uh, with Nathan and before we do I want to introduce my co-host for this evening's ride Mr. John Pounders how you doing John I'm doing all right and uh, tonight I'm going to be less of a co-host and more of a technical guy over here because I'm really interested to hear more about Nathan's book he sent me a copy of it I haven't been able to read it yet David has so I'm going to let them talk and let them really just do that. I'm going to try to make the show as professional as best as I can. Um, this is this is a blessing to be able to do this and to be able to be in the in the company of David Carrico as always on Saturday nights. I always enjoy it, and don't ta I don't take it for granted. So thank you guys so much, and David, take us on the ride. All right. Well, with that, I want to introduce and welcome back once again to the Midnight Ride, Nathan Reynolds. How you doing, Nathan? Doing fantastic, David. It's a it's a real treat to be on here with you guys, and it's been a long time coming. And I uh, couldn't be more excited to be able to share with people uh, this this journey uh, out out of darkness and into light, and and from a world of of truly maddening, just impossible darkness into a place of freedom and hope. And so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And uh, fair warning, right now before we get started into this, this is not the show that that uh, is going to gloss over the realities of this world. This is the show that's going to be very real and honest about what it's like clawing your way out of a filthy, nasty, cruel place and into a much better one. So it's going to be a hard story, but a better one. Glad to be here. And we want to give warning up front. If you are um, an SRA, if you have ritual abuse in your background, if this is something you're dealing with, this show could be very triggering for you and you need to pray whether you want to ask it or not it's not that we're going to be presenting it in an r 
rated fashion, but this is tough material. There's no way to talk about it without talking about the facts of what happened, and this could be triggering for some of you. So you need to make that decision now. If uh, this type of material triggers you, uh, you might not want to watch this show. It's something for you to decide, and a lot of times, um, things like that are very good for people on their journey. So this is something that you're going to have to make that decision on. And it's been my pleasure to get to know Nathan pretty well. We've had some uh, a good association in a lot of ways, and uh, the more I know about him and his family, the more I understand the common bonds we have in the way we think about things, the way we believe and approach things. And after reading this book, uh, there was a lot of things I didn't know. And I know that there's several of our Midnight Right listeners that know quite a bit about Nathan's story, but there's so many things in this book that are just so precious that uh, it, it's just really uh, a wonderful read. But let's begin at the beginning with your family. And uh, there's something you wrote here, and I'm going to read as we go tonight, I'm going to read some excerpts from the book and have you comment on it. And uh, on page 47, excuse me, on yeah, page 47 of your book, you talk about your grandfather and your involvement in these type of things began with your family. And then it progressed and compounded in the military but let's begin with your family um in uh on page 47 you wrote this the memory solidified in brutal terror i had promised you at the beginning of this book that i would not let this be the book where i discussed the pacifics or went into details about the depths of depravity i'd suffered the reality is that my grandfather was a very active member of a brotherhood freely operating within the Knights of the Columbus who engaged in satanic ritual abuse of children while doing occult rituals and ceremonies. The fiery serpentine entities they chose to worship and obey do not deserve to be named. I was one of their chosen ones. And just what did it mean for your family to select you as a chosen one? So this is a very big question. And so for those of you, I'm going to do my best for people that have never heard this before and try to walk you through from an elementary understanding to a much more advanced one. Being born into a Illuminati bloodline or being born into a family that has been involved in generational, multi-generational ongoing depravity and wickedness is nothing like what people think about when they hear the phrase pop culturally an Illuminati person. They, they think of celebrities, they think of people flashing symbols and hand signs, and the reality is it's a far more sophisticated system that has been architected and built into the fabric of our society. These people are builders of worlds, as, as they believe it, and the worlds they build are absolutely set in the cornerstones of darkness. They, these, these are not set in obedience and, and holiness and blessings and love and patience. They're not set in those fruits. The fruits of this kingdom are of a completely different capacity. And so my family members being born into the Reynolds bloodline, the Reynolds were not necessarily the preeminent pure bloods. However, other individuals of my lineage carry darker seeds in their blood, if you will. They genuinely believe that they are carriers of the seed of the serpent. And so because of that, they look at normal individuals as cattle, as lesser humans, as useless eaters. And it gives them the, it affords them the moral perspective to consume people as assets and resources. And so being born into one of these families, what, what is going to start out with you, not every single child will necessarily be selected. There's lots of Reynolds out there that I think never went through any of this. I think there's lots of, of Rothschilds that may not have gone through the same levels of depravity as other family members. However, if you show certain aptitudes at early ages, they will darken you through traumatic systemic abuse. And that's what my grandfather, who, like you said, um, out of page 47, was a high level um, member of the Knights of Columbus who would gather chosen ones for family members um, chosen ones would be the child that's been selected 
as having the best predisposition to being able to endure intense amounts of trauma, fracture their mind um, through what's called dissociation. This is uh, later on what can develop into dissociative identity disorder, what used to be called multiple personality disorder. And that really is the black heart of this kingdom. And that that's the big secret. They're always telling people to hush hush and pass over things like uh, it's schizophrenia. That guy's just crazy or they're bipolar. And the reality is they're hiding this big bad boogeyman, which is split personality, mind control and handlers and uh, individuals that use people like cattle. And so I had an aptitude for certain traits that they desired. Mainly, I had a higher level of intelligence. And so when they split me, I had the ability to maintain aspects of my core at a high level and still have a one personality that could function for the cult and be cult loyal, my nightwalker side. And then I had another front side that was a Christian moral side that was a daywalker. So this, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing is what this is all about, divide and conquer tactics. And, and they base these things off the principles of the word of God, which says a kingdom divide, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And that's exactly what they do is they split someone so they can never stand against the enemy ever again. And the goal is always to shatter the mind so you can control that individual. And my grandfather and other members of his brotherhood uh, were, were, they were Jesuits. There's no way around it. And the Jesuits make some of the best mind control splitters in the world, including and uh, up to assassins, which is what I ended up showing an aptitude for. And one of the things I like about your book, it's not only an inspiring personal story, but there's an inside look at how these things operate and wisdom like there's so many misconceptions like as you just shared and on page 91 of your book you write um, in recent days the phrase the Illuminati has flooded our culture this in fact refers not just to Adam Weissoff 18th century secretive order but the more profound truth abides in the illumined bloodlines if you shared and it's important for us to understand this and your average person uh, when we talk about uh, this type of thing, the bloodline families, they might think of a Hollywood elite, uh, Lady Gaga, and certainly uh, they're a part of it, or they might think of Anton LaVey or some of these guys that just look all jacked up and crazy. But in reality, most of the people that do this could drive an SUV and be married to a soccer mom. Uh, they're the guy next door that are living a double life. They're, uh, they're your school principals. They're your policemen. They're your uh, pillars of society. They're your pastors, oftentimes. And we've got to shatter this conception and look at this issue through this lens if we're, if we're ever going to really see how it operates. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that's really the best way that the enemy hides. He hides himself by being in plain sight. And that's that's the premise that I build on from beginning and end of this book is that you can by being simply looking like a good person, by appearing to be a good Christian and knowing the language and being in the private Christian schools and being around and saturating yourself in a Christian environment all the time, it gives you the ability to blend into that environment at will. You can become that. And that's what my aptitudes were, is that I became this chameleon. Wherever, wherever environment was, I took on the emotional form of whatever my targets or people around me needed me to be so that I could fulfill my purpose there, whether I was being sent in to infiltrate a group or whether I was just being sent in to plant cameras so that we could capture blackmail evidence of sexual abuse and incest or pedophilia, which was my most common trait when I was younger, when I was working with a lot of the, the individuals out of the Knights of Columbus and the Jesuits. They really like to control people through setting them up um, with compromising videos. Compromise is, is their kingdom. And so they're very, very good at making sure to find ways to uh, have a little black book on you and your dirty deeds. And uh, my family got very wealthy by selling secrets, by selling these little black books of individuals uh, who, are in, who later may have become prominent or may not. And uh, either way, they compromise them young, they compromise them early, they find people that have certain aptitudes towards, say, diplomacy, or they might be very, very good at theater and acting, and they will invite them in and grant them an opportunity to get access to contracts that they can never have, or a press, a press 
release package that will allow them to go viral on YouTube in 45 minutes with 250,000 views every 30 seconds. And But the cost is you go into the back room with a girl who will say she's 18, but we all know she's 12, and uh, they're going to film that once. And they, they always tell you this. It's going to be one time that this will happen. The problem is once you're compromised to that degree, who wants that video ever showing up on YouTube? Who wants that coming out across the screens across the earth right now? When you realize that everybody at certain areas of our political system, military industrial complex operates under these confines and constraints, you'll understand why there's not real change. There's no real impactful difference done if you work in their system. And that's why it is so critical for people to learn that God had dictated a different system that he outlined in his word for how we're supposed to walk out of Babylon and into peace and into deliverance and into hope and joy and rest. And my book and this story is, is not something that was watched and experienced. This was something my wife and my daughter and I have lived and breathed and fought for tooth and nail to survive because coming out of this will cost you everything. And I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat over that. If you are in this, if you are someone who has been involved in this, if this has touched your life, you need to understand that there is deliverance available to you no matter how dark it's been. And my darkness is darker than the abyss. My, I have tasted the black waters of the tombs of death. And those who are in there know exactly of what I speak. And when you've drunk of the serpent seed, you know that you are defiled on a scale that most people don't know is real. But I know this, that there is nothing the enemy has done to me that the Lord Jesus Christ has not undone and set me free Amen. from and given me a new purpose and a new calling so that I can turn around and take those same gifts and talents and, and mindsets and abilities and wash them into a new mind and be transformed no longer into this chameleon and this person who infiltrated people and got close to them so I could rip their heart out and bite on their neck and feast on their life. That's not who I am anymore. But I have drunk the blood of people too many times to not know that it will kill you if you keep that life up and by mercy, by his mercy alone, I have been set free from that bondage and I'm still in a process of being set free from that bondage because if you've been through a lifetime of pain, it doesn't get healed necessarily overnight. And I'm not going to sugarcoat any aspect of that for anybody. And this book, what it is, is a very real awesome look into what it's like for someone like my wife who may not have been born into this or known what it was she was getting into when she met me but she stayed with me through this. And this book is so much really our love story and what a real marriage looks like. It's not pretty, but it's powerful. And that's what I want make, to make sure people know that it's better to have a purposeful life than it is to have an empty one. And uh, the understanding we come away with, which is the proper one, is that these people operate in much the way, just like the analogy used with a special, uh, someone on special ops, blend in with your environment, the way that an Islamic sleeper cell would work. Uh, blend in, don't draw attention to yourself. And this is their goal, because this is how they're able to perpetuate what they do. Now, the issue of SRA is something that we revisit regularly on the Midnight Ride. This is something that's been on our heart for several decades. And we get many, many new listeners uh, on an ongoing basis. And just like your book will be read to people that really don't know what SRA even is. And, mm -hmm. on, and this is another good thing about your book, that a person that's coming in Without that knowledge, they're going to come away with a basic understanding of dissociation, DID, and how it works. Now, this is how you stated it on page 48. And you talk about how you survive. You know, you were fighting for your life and for your soul. And you had experiences of uh, the depths of depravity and you stared the evil one in the eye. And on page 48, you write, survival for us came from one word, disassociation. On page 49, you write, to survive the unsurvivable, the soul of the individual splits and tears away from the core personality. During this terrible moment, a blank identity, personality, or fragment 
is created, whose reality and understanding of the world is birthed in this atrocious traumatic event. Because the other personality comes to the surface to endure the trauma, the remainder of the individual's core identity can survive. The fragmented piece of the soul can go on its own or under someone else's manipulation, develop into a complete identity separate from the core person. DID, and I like this, this is something we say over and over, DID is not a psychological disorder like narcolepsy or agoraphobia. It is not a disorder at all. Instead, it is without question a gift of the most beautiful kinds. It is an incredible survival mechanism built into people which helps them endure unspeakable trauma that would kill even the strongest among us. The doctors and technicians call it disassociation. We called it the fade, the slipping of our mind. I, I could just keep going here, but talk about that realization when you begin to understand what had ap actually happened within your soul, your survival through disassociation, and how you found your way back. Oh, that's the big question. These are all big questions. I mean, these are all oh, huge. Really, David, I, to even start that journey is, is something that I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And there's, there's no way around this. When you open up that, that trauma of the past and you let it speak and you let it tell you its story and you finally say that that didn't happen to somebody else, that that's me still. I, I, I no longer curse that side of my life. I no longer deny that it happened. I no longer shake and, and tremble and try to drink it away and drug it away and just look at enough porn to make it all go away and those were all these strongholds I ran to throughout my life as a child I didn't know any better I did everything I could to not think about that other stuff don't remember to remember is pain all these mantras of brainwashing they put in your head to remember is going to make you go crazy and there's going to be a bomb that explodes in your chest and all these other things they put into you during that moment of deepest pain of deepest shame of impossible realities happening in front of your eyes of seeing people you loved torn to ribbons there's nothing that can compare to the feeling of innocence being stolen and i have had my innocence stolen in every area of my life before i had a choice in the matter i didn't get born into a world where free choice was was given i didn't understand free men freedom was a thing people talked about it wasn't like a normal human condition for me. Freedom was something that was dangerous. Freedom was something that could cost you everything. To think for yourself was to die. This, that held me in this prison of constructed realities and kept me from ever being able to speak the secrets. And so I locked all this pain inside myself and I held it and I took it because I could take it and live. I knew how to take that pain. I knew where to stuff it. I knew how to hold on to it. And then at the moment where they would point me at someone, they would convince me was an abuser. They would convince me, oh, this guy's a pedophile. This guy's, a, this guy's an abuser of children. Come and have him. And so I would unleash that rage on that man. I would unleash it and tear him to shreds as a young man. To remember all of that is, is misery, is real, is beautiful, is horrifying, is every emotion that has ever been known to man all at once overwhelming empowering enriching encouraging understanding it's love it's joy it's all these parts of your soul that were locked up they can find freedom in healing and that's the big lie they tell you they tell you that if you remember this stuff it'll kill you but the reality is if you remember if you confess your this deep darkness to the one who who loves you the one who made you no matter what they told you no matter your levels of conception believe me mine are unspeakable and detailed in this book that most people won't know is real no matter where you were born no matter how you were conceived you can be made new your your life can be given purpose because he who made the earth has made you for a, for such a time as this if you are willing to face down those things and give him every area of your heart just like anybody out there who's a normal single-minded person Yahweh wants every bit of your heart. He's not interested in half-hearted individuals. He's interested in people that are dedicated to seeing their life changed. Not a little bit, all of it. Giving him every ounce of your life. 
And that's what he called for me. And because of that, David, I had this identity, not in myself, not in what my handler said about me, not as Jason, not as the soldier, not as the assassin, not as the infiltrator and the chameleon. No, I had an identity as a son of God. I had an identity that was with purpose and meaning and passion. And I had a wife who loved me even even after this um, came to the surface. And she, she covered me. And she was a safe harbor to me. And she said, yeah, God's people even love murderers. You know, and I didn't know that, David. Uh, I didn't know God's people could, could love people like me, you know. And I know that now. I believe that now because I've tested it. I've tested people for years and years and years. I've tested people. And I've seen that there's a remnant of believers out there who actually read this book like they mean it and believe Amen. it. And then they fight with gritted teeth to yeah. see people set free. And because of that, I'm alive. Because of that, my daughter is free, and she's not another child passed through the fires of black flames and served up to Moloch and these wicked ones. My daughter is free to be the the woman that she was made to be and not bound in captivity and passed through my grandfather's filthy fingers. And we want to say, too, that those of you that are on this journey to wholeness and those of you that are involved in this and have not started that journey— you can be set free and made whole, but there's no way to do that without serious repentance and total commitment unto the Father through the shed blood of Yeshua. There's no other way back. And it is uh, something you wrote here on page five. Uh, and I really do appreciate your courage and the pain. You're very transparent. You're very honest in this book. And the pain is so real. You can feel your pain as you read this book. And because you're doing that, you're going to touch people where they're at in their pain. And on page five, you talk about something that, uh, if there's anything more evil than this, I don't can't imagine what it would be. But you right on verse five here, I could not wait any longer. I couldn't wait for a snuff film to surface showing me as a boy fighting another child to death with knives and dirt pits for sports and status. I couldn't wait for my teenage, young teenage face to be on the news as I was used by another brotherhood to kill one of their own. Now, there's more to this whole thing than jacked up perverts driven by sexual spirits wanting to gratify themselves on children there is that but there's also the element of a multi-billion dollar industry through snuff films through uh kitty porn uh through the human trafficking of children uh child prostitution speak to that aspect from the Absolutely. inside view that you had and were even a part of in a snuff film Absolutely. and uh, there's a huge uh, snuff films on the black net uh, I have no idea what they sell for I know they're expensive and there's a tremendous market for it absolutely the 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 marketplace you're talking about really bef- my time in a lot of my early years obviously the mainstream internet was not something a lot of people knew however if everyone paid attention the internet as we know it came out of advanced military projects and science and research projects like places in CERN, Switzerland and places here in the United States with DARPA. And so there's been a huge underground web base that's been up and running for many, many, many years longer than people realize. And so there's always been a very nice underground marketplace to distribute snuff films. And for most people, I recognize they probably don't know what a snuff film is. They don't have never seen one and don't blame you. They're horrific. But as people desire more and more gratification from other things when basic pornography, when basic male, male and female sex is not enough. It it tends to gratify and seek deeper levels of satisfaction. And there are people who are drawn to the sexual abuse of children in order to find that pleasure. There's also people that are very drawn to seeing death, sadomasochism and death and pain and torture in addition to uh, those, those elements my family realized that I had this affinity to be able to take in huge quantities of information and become that. And so I had this mimicry ability. And so I got passed into um, being turned into a very young 
dark energized uh, individual who had all this pent up rage and they would put a knife in my hand and I was more than happy to stab someone through the neck. And uh, I didn't mind doing that and I was very good at it and I got a lot better at it as I grew up. And so they would film um, me fighting other uh, people and kids at times and um, uh, men and things uh, that people don't know about. And there's literally pits in the ground they'll do this in. There's houses they'll do this in, garages outside. It doesn't matter. You can street fights or um, a many, many billion dollar uh, or many, many billion views on YouTube. You can watch people fighting on YouTube for entertainment all the time. Well, the same things they do it with kids and they really like seeing little kids fighting grown men with daggers. And uh, that's what I did for them. And, and my grandfather and other family members of mine uh, who had connections into the military projects groups, uh, a lot of them East Coast. Uh, the Reynolds are a much bigger bloodline and family empire uh, on the East Coast than necessarily some of the markets out here. And so my family members were brought into a different area to start up another generation of it. And so they filmed these things and they realized that they could sell a, a programming uh, to how to turn your child into a good assassin. And with demonization, ritual abuse, as well as training from operatives that are basically mercenaries for hire and uh, may be former Delta operators. They may be former Marine Force recon. They may just be guys who have, have killed way, way too much an MS-13 or another Hashashin out of the Middle East. They'll bring in over whoever it is that's needed to train you and equip you to be able to go into do infiltrations because who suspects a child is going to be the guy who's, who steals secrets out of your vault at a, at a nice party. Uh, they, they just assume my mom and dad are there and I'm just a little kid and, and uh, I can just get away with all kinds of things. And so that's what happened. And I, I did that for many years until the military um, caught me on camera, we'll say, and uh, doing some of this work. And they, they approached my family members and bought my little black book of mind control tactics and uh, started using me and handling me at a younger age than uh, is legally allowed. And it, what could be any tougher than to realize, like you write on page 110 in your book, the family realized they could convince me to kill anyone for them so long as I believed they were a pedophile, brute, a trafficker, or children, or someone who covered up these types of crimes. What a, it, It's hard to get your mind around overcoming the trauma from your family using you as assassin. I mean, that's that's rough. And you talk about, and there's the aspect of your family that gives us insight into how these things work. And on page 55, you talk about the way that not just the children in these bloodline families are selected, but the way they reach out to recruit others in. On page 55, you write, uh, my pedophilic abusers were specifically recruited and connected to their young victims, their altar boys through the Knights of Columbus and its various seasonal youth groups and finder programs. Now, not everybody in the Knights of Columbus is a Satanist, but within this group, and this was true with your family, they use that religious system as a venue for recruitment, and they recruited people out of that venue. And you write on page 67, uh, and, and this is why uh, we say that uh, assembly should be a safe place, you know, a safe place, and we've got to guard against these things. And we have to warn that while not every one of these groups are Satanists, they're not safe places because this is a reality and an ever-increasing one. On page 67, you write this, um, or think uh, of the Roman Catholic Church burning alive hundreds of thousands of those who spoke the truth by a peasant's tongue, those lips of commoners who were unsanctioned by the popes, their anti-Messiah, the ones who sits enthroned instead of the true Christ. I think of those followers of Messiah who refused to compromise on the instructions of the living God for the sake of a higher inheritance that was yet to come. And address that aspect of this whole thing, the way that they recruit and that they use religious systems 
to reach out. And it happens, it just doesn't happen in Catholicism. It happens in Protestantism. It's happened in Jehovah Witness, Mormonism. They're not safe places if the, if the leadership is not aware. But just speak to that aspect of it for just a bit, if you would, Nathan. Absolutely. So what, what David is addressing, he threw out a phrase in there called finders programs. Um, these can look different in, in different contexts. What David is asking is about the religious context of it. The military, so the United States is basically the military arm of this system. Uh, Great Britain, the Lords of London and Mayor, those are the financial hubs in many aspects. And then Rome tends to be the great harlot that dispenses the religious aspects of this underworld. And so those that's really important to understand. So I touched on two sides of that as my life went along. I My understanding for what it is that David's asking about the finer's programs were really targeted towards people that were in Christian, Catholic, whatever kind of vein of right-hand path stuff. So people that are good at putting on a really bright, beautiful face and in the meantime, they are totally open Luciferians behind closed doors. And so this is the two-faced mentality of the gods of old. And so that your emperor could on one face be the one who heals and blesses the land. On the other side, he is the dark one like Osiris. And uh, so really what happens is they will teach you as a young child how to recruit people into this, how to befriend other people that say they want a 10 year old boy or they want a nine year old boy because it's a very common age that's used for abuse and sacrifice. Maybe someone who's in a bloodline, maybe somebody who's not it depends on what ritual or what summoning or rite they're trying to perform. So children, other children that are programmed will be sent into the children's ministries of churches, or they will more often than not have a woman or a man in a position of authority in that church who is the best guy at the church. He's the guy who never misses a weekend. He's the guy who's involved in everything and every volunteer opportunity you could have. He's going to show up at your house and help fix it up. Anytime you have need, if you have a baby, he's going to make sure to drop by food and his wife and his family are always looking so good for everyone to see. And then meanwhile, they are grooming you. They are patient and methodical and they are grooming you to be able to take control of you when they want. And so that might be, hey, have Johnny come over for a sleepover. You know, we're great people, right? And that night, Johnny is welcomed into a world that people can't even imagine. And they terrorize him to such a state that he keeps the secrets of what happened over at their friend's house that one time or for the next 10 years of his life. And that is how people are brought into this that may not have been born into it. And my family and specifically a lot of the Christian front organizations that are out there are a completely different thing than what people believe them to be. They're very good at wearing a Christianese mask that slides off and slips under the heat of persecution. And you start to see their true colors and the cockroaches that are in their flesh rise to the surface when you convict them with the word of God. And when you show them that there is authority in speaking the truth, that there's power in speaking the secrets, that nothing this world has done cannot be undone by Yeshua and by Jesus Christ and the shed blood of the perfect redeemer. And he can set people free from that. And I have seen that power and that authority set demon possessed children free. I was one of those demon possessed people who had a blood oath contract with a familiar serpent of death. Okay. I know what that feels like to have that power available to you when you are overwhelmed with incapacity to fight back. And they offer you this ability to do things that you can't imagine as real. And you want that, and so you take it, and you drink it in, and you get bound to a darkness. And the only thing that can set you free from that is a genuine and authentic commitment. Not a, not a Jesus, come into my heart and be Lord of my heart, and oh my goodness, we're not looking for for a emotional conversion. We are looking for or emotional reaction. We're looking for converts to the, a totally different way of living. And that's what God has always been interested in is a convert to his set apart ways. We're supposed to be people that are weird, peculiar, a set apart people, a Royal priesthood. That's our identity. We're not supposed to look like the world. We're supposed to not be like them, but that doesn't mean that we don't look like them at times that we weren't all 
going through our own moments before the truth of God hit us in the face or the realities of this corrupt system or somebody's mandating you get take this vaccine and you're pregnant and you have no idea what to do. Do I take the shot or do I wear this mask and suffer in shame for the next six months? Well, those are questions people are wrestling with every day. And it's time each and every one of us takes a stand to decide which kingdom we're gonna serve. I was born into the kingdom of darkness. I have tasted the serpent's ash. I know what it feels like to see a, a phoenix rise from the ashes, but I have also seen that there is power in resurrection and there's power in the authority of his name. And he has resurrected the dead parts of my soul back to life. And he can do that for every one of you, whether you're dealing with divorce or the pains of someone who looked at you and said something to you when you were young about your body or your your identity or your IQ. And he said a lie about you that you believed your whole life. And it's time to get free from that lie, just as much as it's time to get free from physical shackles the emotional and spiritual ones are the ones that got to come off first before we can be free to walk in a, in a new life. Amen. And I want to say that you can get your questions ready for Nathan, and we will be um, allowing presenting your questions to Nathan here at our usual time. And I don't have my watch, John, so give me a heads up on question time. And uh, I want to say, keep your questions as brief as possible and to the point. We're not going to be able to answer all of them. And so keep it spiffy and try to keep them short as possible to the point so we can get through as many as we can. And we will certainly appreciate that very, very much. And you mentioned here also something that um, we don't like to think about really even being true or existing uh, on page 114 in chapter 16 of uh, your chapter you entitled it blood makes the green grasses grow and you talk about as you just alluded to the military finders programs they operate just like you say in many different venues they've got their people in place where they're recruiting and looking in many places and you write here on page 114 just after turning 17 years old and while still a junior in high school, I was emancipated to the United States Army and pressed into one of their projects for Chosen One. The military has high regard and, acti and actively recruits through many finders programs for individuals with dissociative identity disorder and fully enhanced alternate personalities. Now, speak just a little bit about why would the military want people with DID and how were you found by the military and identified as someone that they saw they could use and manipulate? Well, first of all, I was found, um, not really, right? Uh, there is a very profitable method to grooming someone towards that goal. And just like just like a MLB contract might be sold for a player and there is physical examination, mental examinations, if a guy's gonna get a $12 million contract, they're gonna spend some time really digging into his capacity, his likelihood for injury, his predispositions, his emotional state, his physical wellness, his overall spiritual wellness. They're going to dig into all these areas. So that is an investigatory process. Same thing happens with people that are going to be recruited into top tier teamwork. Um, this is gonna be a lot of the teams that are not really acknowledged. So they, they would be fall into this area called special access projects or unacknowledged special access projects, USAPs or SAPs. And so these are things that are, their funding for these things and projects does not come from areas that have congressional oversight. There's not lots of eyes looking at what these guys are doing with this money. So the individuals that are in there, I had a uncle, we'll say, who uh, was in the military, in the army, who had a great connection source. And so that was a uh, army connection. I also had a scoutmaster who was a high level individual at, at a, a very public underground military base in Colorado. And so he was a light colonel over there and got me involved in the SAP programs in the Air Force. And so that was how my connections came, was through what we call friends of the family. 
So friends is a British SAS term for a spy. And so when someone says, I have a friend in the, in the industry or I have a friend in the family, what they're saying is, I have a spy in there, generally a split multiple, because that's the perfect spy, right? A spy who doesn't know they're a spy. A spy who wakes up in the morning as a soccer mom and who goes to get her kids ready for school and it's just another day, right? It's just another day. And then suddenly she drops her kids off at school and she wakes up six hours later and there's chunks of bodies, pieces of a data hard drive or a cell phone that's lit on fire and burning in her backyard and she wakes up there and has no idea what just happened. That is a good spy, right? And that is what projects came out of the SS and a lot much older than this, but scientifically brought to fruition through Mangala, Dr. Green or Dr. Cherry. A lot of these individuals were brought over from Germany through the recruitment projects of like Operation Paperclip and lots of other recruitment projects that got guys who had been doing this level of research on human beings in concentration camps for medical testing and research. There was a no greater time for human experimentation than what happened during that time. So my family members had a lot of connections through those bloodlines and through friends who taught them how to shatter the mind systematically and very scientifically build a perfect spy. And that's what I was was recruited to be, was someone who could look really, really normal, look like just another guy on the street, and then wear a blade strapped to my chest, waking, sleeping 24 seven, having razor blades sewn underneath the leathers of my shoes and being able to move in the shadows and walk in the shadows and use my, my familiar spirits to do things like that don't naturally happen without enhancements, remote viewing, astral projection. That's one class of it. Then there's, you can read a book called the minutes who stare at goats, which very publicly goes through this. And one of the bases that harbored a lot of this is Fort Knox, Kentucky a very big base for armored uh, in, armored artillery, armored tanks, armored auxiliary units, as well as basic combat training for infantry uh, MOS soldiers. So it's a great place that they can move a soldier into there like all the rest of them and then do all this other programming and training with that individual and set them up to go into these projects. Meanwhile, the rest of the world looks at your uh, DD-214 and it sees nothing. It literally says nothing and nothing and nothing more and just a normal dude. And so, like you said, David, it's all about keeping that gray, that gray man mentality in all of these areas. And um, I have some more detailed questions about that I'd like to ask, but I don't want our time to get away from us. There's so many uh, really things here that I liked in something that deals with things as dark as snuff films and being manipulated by your family to be a, a a killer. There's some real refreshing cool drinks of water throughout this book that I really like that'll make you smile. And one of them, uh, here on page 17, your relationship with Chelsea. So we want to talk about that. Uh, we had Chelsea and you both on the midnight ride one night and just loved her to death. And our listeners did too. And you talk here about of spiritual virginity and this is not just uh, good for you it's good for everybody there's such a real blessing here for people that are at this point of her life but you write this on page 17 Chelsea and I were so thankful to be able to offer each other our bodies in purity though we had sinned throughout our lives God had preserved this gift in us, and it is a miraculous testimony to God's grace for even his wandering children. And I love that, how that even though there had been sin in the past, that that state of spiritual virginity where you could bless your union in purity and see God's blessings. But just speak to that a little bit and also tell the story about the wedding ring. I'd never (laughs) heard that before. I love the story about the wedding ring. Just too awesome. Well, Chelsea was um, someone I didn't think I I could ever deserve. Right? Uh, you you think you're you're defiled. You know you're defiled. You you believe it. It it is an identity all its own. And uh, like I didn't have to wonder if someone had crushed my innocence and taken areas of of my body that should have never been had. 
And uh, lots of people have had that happen to them. Lots of people have compromised um, for good reasons, for bad reasons, for horrible things, for great things, for people they loved and who they thought loved them and people who lied to them and used them and dispensed them like a Pez candy on the side of a shelf. And uh, sexuality and union of a man and a woman coming together, intimacy, intimacy is real. Intimacy is rare. And intimacy of a physical, spiritual, emotional kind is not of this world. And we are spiritual beings experiencing this reality. We are eternal ones. We're immortals in a sense for our soul will go on after we perish. And maybe this body of skins and scars and marks of their perversion on my body will pass away. But I will be raised again and given a new life. And I believe that happens when we set ourselves apart for him, when we call upon his name and say, I want to be like you. I want to I want to know you. Can I know you? Can you love me? And he'll say, yes. <laughs> he'll say, I do. I love you. I've always loved you. And I proved it. And let me show you how I proved it. From Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning to the end, this book, his story is true. It's history from his perspective. And it's powerful. And I learned in there that my sexuality and, and my virginity and the areas I guarded to try not to let a woman have sex with me in that way and all these little things I did was to try to hold on to this sense of innocence that I could still have something to give my wife that hadn't been given to somebody else or stolen by somebody else. And that was real when I found out that you could have a spiritual identity of being like, from this day forward, I make a decision that as I date Chelsea, as I get to know her, as I love her, as I, as I learn to know her, I will preserve her and protect her even from my own lusts until I know that she is mine and I am hers and we are set apart to each other. And that happens in that moment of, of, of intimacy. That happens when you consummate your marriage. In the eyes of the father, that's the moment where you are husband and wife. And so there's a spiritual ramification there of soul ties and of a, of a genuine knitting together of each other's souls. And that's why, that's why Jesus warned us that, hey, every sin that a man may commit is outside the body, but sexual sin, meaning sex in the context outside of how he designed it to be, has a great cost and is different, okay? And so it should be treated different. It should be respected. It should be guarded. And if yours wasn't, neither was mine. But God guarded me once I made that decision and helped me to be set apart to her. And because of that, we were able to impart to each other our virginity wholly and completely to know oneness and intimacy. And uh, that's a battle. That's not something that's easy. And your wedding night and just all this honeymoon phase, of course, is going to end. But David alluded to a story that's there in the beginning of the book, which is really a lot of it in the beginning is just our love story and of us having this, you know, Oh, gooey eyed romance. And like, I romanced my wife uh, when I was dating her and I, I loved her and I wanted to be with her and I hungered for her. And so on our wedding, on our, on our honeymoon, uh, we went swimming and snorkeling in, in the, the Gulf of, of Mexico, or sorry, the Sea of Cortez. And it's just an absolute paradise down there. And we're down in the waters and I'm out on the water swimming away because the water for me was so beautiful. I love being in the water. It's safe. It's it's, I can hear everything so clearly. It's, it's, I know the water is a place where I feel at home. And Chelsea, it's nah, not quite like that. So she's on the beach and she's hanging out and, and she's drinking and, and trying to endure the 108 degree heat. And uh, I'm out there bobbing in the waves and diving and snorkeling and looking at fish and, and looking at a lot of broken bottles and bottle caps. And I'm in about 25 feet of water. And uh, I come up to the surface and go like this with my hands and my wedding ring flies off into the ocean. <laughs> I'm, I'm in about four foot swells, nothing rowdy, but enough to be noticeable. And uh, I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable in that environment. But I show this tungsten wedding ring off into the middle of the ocean. I watch it. I pop my head down and I see it going down into the sand. And then these waves come rolling over it, sinking it down. It disappears. Right. And I'm like, no, like. Rule number one is like, don't lose your wedding ring and all this other like Americanized Roman Egyptian tradition about your wedding ring. Like it's so there. I'm like, I can't lose that thing. Otherwise my marriage in some symbol is lost. And I'm three days into it. And I'm like, no. So I try to dive down and I start looking for it, spending it uh, as long as I can on the bottom. But who's going to find a wedding ring in the middle of the ocean, right? But I, 
as I'm sitting there on the surface, I, this verse comes to my mind. This story comes to my mind. I start praying and asking for his help. And he leads me to Second Kings, I believe it's 6, um, where they are Elijah, who's this prophet, back in, in the time of, of the, the split houses, right? So Israel and Judah, the two houses are separate and distinct. Elijah is this prophet, this set-apart guy um, to Yahweh. He, he is out there. They're chopping wood, and a guy is swinging an axe next to the Jordan River. It's like the Mississippi River, right? Vision, just this huge, raging river. He's swinging his axe, and they're just hanging out, building stuff for his home. And the iron axe head goes whoop off into the middle of the river. And, like, he cries out to Elijah, and he's like, Elijah, it was borrowed. It was borrowed. Like, I need to get that back. Axe, iron axes are expensive back then. Don't don't kid yourself. The stuff used to be expensive because it, it had real substance to it. And so Elijah says, don't worry about it. Show me where you did it. And he grabs a stick and throws it into the river, and the axe head floats up to the surface, and he retrieves it. And it's like this six-verse story in the middle of our Bible or in this one chapter. It's like a footnote. And to me, that verse came into my mind, and I just prayed that. I said, I believe, Father, that you can make my ring float. And sure enough, I dive down to the bottom on the next dive, and I'm looking over the surface, and there's bottle caps and junk down there. It's a tourist beach. They're gross. And so I'm diving down there, and sure enough, I see on the top of the sand is this little ring. It's my wedding ring. And I just couldn't believe it. And I grab it, and I run to the surface, and I'm like at a 10. I'm so excited. And I run to the beach, and Chelsea's like, <laughs> I love it. Hot. It's hot. Like I'm, go- I'm like, look at what happened. This amazing thing. And but, anyways, it's it's a, it's a story that shows me that God cares about us, even for little things. Like He knew that mattered to me, and like my understanding and reality of what it was, and all this other stuff didn't matter. That meant a lot to me. That meant everything to me because I believed that His Word was still true and still active and still alive today, and that He still cared about us and He could do miracles. Like the God of the Bible is real, and He really does do miracles for those that call on His name and believe Him. It's all real. Like, it's not just some fairy tale. It's not some felt board thing. I've lived it. I've known it. I've tested it. And I have faith in him now. And I have a childlike faith that's been earned through stripes and through healing and through restoration. And that's what this story is chronicled for me. It's a book about the redemption and the restoration of my wife and I's marriage when she goes from that romantic man to a murderer who goes out and hunts monsters at night and who hides his identity and is never on camera and is using burner cell phones and has got bullets and blades on his body waking and sleeping and is hiding stuff in the woods hundreds of miles from his house and has different identities and passports and all kinds of things that never were there when she met me. Yeah, but then they were there. Uh, that's a great segue. And um, on page 23 and 24, you begin to talk about that. As you're beginning to get into, you say on page 23, I was a stranger to myself. I didn't know where they found this man in the mirror, but he was not me. Soon Chelsea could plainly see something very different in me. When we would go out together, I went by a new name, Jason. And after that beautiful start to a wonderful marriage, the problems came in and talk about this realization when you begin to look in the mirror and wonder who this guy was and started going by another name and the impact that had upon Chelsea this is um, had to be huge well who who can understand that David who's uh yeah who's ever woken up who's ever woken up next to a person that is not the man you married I think there's a lot of women out there who woke up this morning to a man that they don't recognize. They don't, they don't know who he is. They don't, she doesn't know who she is. Right. And it's easy for in marriage life to life to happen and people to drift. And if you do not guard your marriage, Oh, there's plenty of things that will drive wedges between you two. Mine were very pronounced. Mine were very noticeable. I changed my name, changed my hairstyle, changed everything about myself, my hobbies, my friends. I I burned every area of my life. I literally burned it. That's not like figurative. Like I have a burn barrel in my backyard that I burn thousands of documents, phones, all kinds of stuff in, right, for many years because that's what I did. That's what I was taught to do. You don't leave a trace. A a man is not to be seen. A child is not to be seen or heard. You're supposed to be a ghost. And how do you be a ghost when you've got a marriage? Who, Who teaches you how to have a marriage while being a chameleon, right? They don't teach you this fundamental knowledge. And so I... My personality, my core personalities were primarily Nate 
right? This much more outgoing day walker, bubbly, lively, vivacious man, passionate man to this serious, somber, focused, sophisticated, targeted, articulate individual who is calculating and who is absolutely not concerned with morality because laws as you guys think of them, right, are tools in our handbook or ways that you can use them to manipulate people and or hide yourself in plain sight, right? Morality is a very vague thing to a person who grows up in that world. And when your State Department former handlers come in and reactivate you because they want you to go do work for them or your greedy family members uh, want to knock you off, uh, that's what they do. They switch your core personalities out and that's what happened. And the book goes through a lot more details on that. And I'll leave that for the readers to go find us. The book comes out um, this next week and people are able to read it for themselves. But for Chelsea and I's marriage to survive that, we both had to be willing to stand on something that most people don't understand, which is covenant. Marriage is not a choice. Marriage is not, love is not a choice. Love is a commitment. It is a covenant. It is something you continue to decide to do, not because you feel like it, but because you know that a covenant is not to be broken. A covenant is something that God showed his people from beginning to end what it means. And God stands with us in our covenants when we honor him and, and cling to him. He will honor us and protect us and provide for us. And I begged him with weeping and gnashing to save my marriage because my wife knew nothing about me. My wife had no idea who I was. And she woke up to a stranger. She was a married widow. And she woke up to a man who was a shell of himself, a man who didn't want her to touch him, didn't want her to look at him, didn't want to talk to her. I wanted nothing to do with this normal life. It was baggage. And that's so brutal and gross to say and think about. But a lot of people have those thoughts every day and your spouse can feel that. They can know it. They just may not be able to articulate it. And my wife didn't have language to understand hey, uh, did any of your guys' husbands start wearing a knife to 24-7? Or uh, do you guys ever find, like, guns everywhere hidden in crazy places? Like, my husband does this stuff, and he never used to touch guns. Like, what is this? She didn't have any of that. Who do you ask questions like that to? Most people don't know anything about any of this, right? It's intentionally shielded from them. And so she didn't have anybody to turn to until we started really encountering what's this fringe kind of Christian movement of truth and awakening that started because people were bold enough to speak the secrets. Russ Dizdar, I sat in a conference as a chameleon four years ago, and Russ Dizdar gave a speech down at the Prophecy in the News conference where he talked about satanic infiltration of the church. And my wife and I went there, and he started talking about assassins, split personality assassins, and he said they'll have knives strapped to their chest 24-7. And my wife kind of looks over at me and smiles, and I smile at her, and like, there's a knife strapped to my chest, like as I'm sitting there, like there's a lot of other knives strapped all over because they're quiet and they're efficient. And how do you explain that? Well, now I finally started seeing that there are people that were out there speaking the secrets and that maybe there's maybe like God could still heal me. Like maybe our marriage shouldn't just die. Maybe I should fight for it. Maybe I shouldn't fight the man in the mirror. Maybe I shouldn't fight my wife. Maybe I should stop fighting God. Maybe I should fight for something of worth of eternal importance, which is covenant. I should fight for my covenant. I should protect my covenant. I should provide for my wife. I should love her. I should provide a hedge of protection around her, even from myself. And that's real because I was a bag of bondage coming into that marriage. And I was a bomb of, of addictions. And God started walking us through that for years. And that's not something that just ended one day when I made that decision. It started there and I got to work. And God continues to work these things out with us because that's how it's supposed to be. It's a walk. And he's supposed to walk with us through Amen. this, lead us, show us how to do this. Teach me how to forget these former ways of being and teach me a new way of seeing and understanding and teach me how to walk in authority and in freedom and in power and in hope. And because of that, my wife and I's marriage has intimacy. I know her. I love her. I believe in her. I know what it is that she was made for. And she loves me. And she loves my many other faces that came up to say hi. And we all now choose as an act of our will to be in covenant with her and to choose her above all else 
women wise and other other areas of our life she is ours and we are hers right and that's exclusivity that's what god wants from us and we're supposed to demonstrate that to the world we're supposed to be exclusively his and not be like the rest of the world who's got Amen. plenty of other paganistic pantheistic gods and traditions to choose from be set apart be holy as he is holy and that's what i'm fighting for every day i choose this day who I will serve. And today I chose to serve Yahweh. Today I chose to serve my wife, to love her, to wash her in the word. Today I chose to be a good father to my daughter. Today I chose to be a good man, but I've chosen a lot of days in my life to be a wicked one, to be a son of Belial and to be a murderer and a thief and a liar and a monster. And you know what? I'll deal with that before him on my, my judgment. I'm accountable for that. And so is every person who ever had a part in this. And I tell you what, he is judging us and his fire will come down and burn the earth. And I want to stand with him and against that fire, I want to survive it. And that's the story is that God can snatch you from the fires of his judgment and save you from the depths of darkness and cause you to be set apart for him and shine like a light of hope for the world and say, these are the words of my testimony. I will speak them no matter what they say or do to me, whether they fillet my flesh off or they give me a platform on the stage of the world. I don't care. I am here for him and not for myself and not for you or anybody else, but to see his name praised and to see him be glorified. Amen. And um, here on page 121, uh, you begin talking about um, internal programming, the way that that operates and the effect that it had on you. Um, on page 121, you write, much of the internal programming systems personalities are based on the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. For example, beta, also called cat or kitten programming, is a seducer and sex slave personality. Delta programming is advanced militaristic infiltration, exfiltration, and assassin training programs. And you hear the term beta kitten and it remind some of the pictures that are in your book and some others that we've seen that you've sent us that were taken of you as a young child that were blatantly provocative and it reminds me of a picture that's circulating now around the internet of Miley Cyrus I don't know if you've seen it you probably have where she is dressed as a little child in infant's clothing doing very provocative sexual things and there's something that brought you to uh and uh, i want you to talk about the basic concepts of how this internal programming works and also you go on here to talk about omega being the end of the alphabet entails the program self-destruction of an asset and the Omega program was triggered in you. And mm -hmm. when it was, it almost killed you. It took you to a place of near death. But just if you can, explain uh, the basic concepts of internal programming, how it works, and how it worked on you and almost killed you. So I, I can only speak from my personal experience. So different families, different brotherhoods, um, different government agencies might shape and build internal programming very differently. And so my family and the traditions that were taught and engrafted into us had a very, very systematic approach from shattering of the mind was very scientific. They would find areas that caused you the most pain. Uh, if you're someone who feared snakes, had a predisposition towards, I really don't like snakes being on me. They're going to put you in environments that cause so much overwhelming fear and anxiety. Maybe they'll just lock you in a closet. Nothing crazy. Lock you in a closet and put speakers in that closet that play at an unbelievable level the sound of hissing, all that just overwhelming you, right? As they put a couple snakes on your feet and you're barefoot or you're naked and they put you in there until you shatter your mind, until you dissociate, until you fade out, right? And once that few doubt faded state is there and ready for them that kind of purple compliance is there where really nobody's home or somebody else's home now 
Then they come out and they're going to sit you down generally in a chair. They're going to make you feel comfortable. They're going to bond you with the abuser, put you in there because he's the one who pulled you out. And that new personality thinks that's the guy who saved me. Oh my gosh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. And you're bonded to that person who is your abuser. That's a hand whip, right? That's a pimp, pimp and whore relationship. There's no way around it. It's the exact same thing, whether it's a pimp and whore doing dime bag deals on the street and little, you know, $5 deals in corners on, uh, for, for blowjobs and whatever else, or it's high level, very VIP hooker and sexual, um, prowess being used and employed and profited on it's, it can look very similar. And so it doesn't take a lot to connect some of these dots here, but once you're in that state, they will tell you who your identity is, tell you your name a lot of times, tell you your function, tell you your purpose, why you're here, what it is that you are made for, all these wonderful ways of, of pleasing people and taking care of them and making sure that they feel satisfied. And that is a lot of times when they will bring in someone who is already trained in the art of seduction. It's a very real art. Azazel taught women how to beautify their eyes, how to put on this beauty mask that would show the world what they want to see, not who you are. They, they don't want to show the world who you are. No, no, no. Because they might actually need to know who you are before they do that. No, they want to show the world a mask. And that is what women and men and people have to put on in order to go out in the world and survive on a day-to-day -day basis. Same thing. That personality is the one who knows how to put on that mask and how to seduce and entice and how to please and sexually um, work their body as an asset on another person to disarm them just maybe for a few seconds as you get close and you flash them a look and allows you to get close enough to make your strike or to plant an evidence on them or to plant a tracker on them or whatever else. It's a very useful tool in the trade, they call it. And so on one scale, that would be a beta programming. Delta would, like we've talked about, I had a lot more Delta later on in life. And that's the Jason side. That's the soldiering side. That's the Argonaut side of programming and black operation projects. That's that systematic switching from one personality to another so that the spies and the secrets are kept. Um, at the end of a life cycle of a split personality individual, you may have other personalities in and amongst there that just do basic functions like driving. And they're able to just focus on that. Other people at, at other ends of that spectrum might be your daywalker side. That's what everybody knows you as. At the very end of a program, if say like, I was not being compliant with them. I started disobeying a direct order. Um, there isn't a military tribunal that they'll drag you in front of when you disobey a colonel uh, who tells you to do something that you know is going to cost a lot of innocent people their life. And when you say no to a master, when you say no to uh, the general, you better be careful, right? And so... That being said, I said no to them and God started a process of breaking me out because of that. I said yes to him that I would not obey wicked ones anymore. And so what they do is they will put you through a process of implanted regression activation where a lot of these pre-programmed ideas about how to kill yourself are brought to the surface and turned on. And so I went through a heavy amount of drug and um, really what is psychological warfare, psyop programming and deprogramming through the Air Force, uh, my original archetypes of my Delta system. And what they did is they reactivated those Omega systems in myself. And so I obeyed the, their commands and was under about 18 different psychotropic medications. And within two weeks, I completely shattered again. And they brought in uh, the closer. And the closer is someone who cleans up messes of somebody who's out there saying too much or not obeying or whatever else. And the closer was myself, right? And so, in that dissociative state, I shot and stabbed myself multiple times uh, in sort of bleeding out to death on the patio of my parents' basement uh, on Thanksgiving morning. And uh, I was supposed to die that day. And uh, there's no way around it. My father would have gotten very rich if I had died that day and added a little other piece to his uh, putrefied kingdom. And uh, I would have gone away and all the secrets in my heads would have died with me. And that was the goal. That was the goal. And uh, I was never supposed to have uh, this life. I was never supposed to taste joy and freedom in a family. And, but God had a different plan for me. And I'll tell you what, I stood there bleeding to death on the patio of my parents' basement. And I saw my familiar come to harvest me because that's what I pledged to him. I pledged that I would be bound to him after my death, that he and I would be together. And 
He came for me to harvest me. I'm bleeding out. Um, and I saw the angel of the Lord come. And it's not like, it's not like a movie. It's not this like crazy, insane theatrical appearance. It is my familiar who I know very well. And more often than not, they look like normal people kind of. And he came to me and the angel of the Lord stood between me and said, he is mine. You cannot have him. And that was it. And I saw my familiar filled with fear, filled with terror, filled with dread and yield and obey him. And I never knew that there was power like that in Jesus Christ. I never knew that he was the most high. I had no idea. And I saw that. And I said, if he says I'm his, they can't have me anymore. And I could be set apart. And it started there. I bandaged my, I did my best to triage myself and to go into basic combat life saving, like I've been trained to do and did my best to stitch myself up and hold myself together and called 911. And you know what? It took a long time to get there. If anybody out there knows what a slow roll is, that's what was called in on me. And so for 30 minutes almost, I sat there bleeding to death. And the only thing that kept me alive was his mercy at that point. And it is only by his grace. I was flown in flight for life. It was a big televised event. There's all these news articles, hundreds of thousands of people on Thanksgiving morning see me getting loaded into a helicopter and flown to a hospital. And this lie about a break-in robbery that had been put into my head comes regurgitated out like they told me to. I tell everyone, somebody else did this to me. I'm a liar. Three days later, I come out and tell the truth with some family-initiated detectives and family members uh, to orchestrate the story. And they just call me crazy. And they just call me bipolar. And nobody knows the difference. And uh, in a town, uh, military towns out there, everybody just swallows the, uh, the hook, line, and sinker of the propaganda piece. And everybody moves on and says, that guy's crazy. And that's what they did. And so then for the next... 18 months of my life, I was moved into horrific reconditioning and reprogramming uh, with a lot of pharmaceuticals uh, at, a, at a very prestigious university out here in Colorado uh, that is very good at working with family members. And so that's what happened. I got a handler, a case manager uh, up here, and I went to college as a shattered individual and uh, for all intents and purposes was out of the trade um, until I wasn't and until they forced me to come back into it and uh, held my finger to the, to the edge of the blade again. Well, I believe at this time, I mean, it's just awesome to see the power of God released through Yeshua and what it can do. I mean, um, we serve a miraculous, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God. And um, we can call upon him in the day of trouble, and he, he will answer. And I, the wedding ring story, it makes me think of things in our life. Um there have been times when we were had a car break down and we didn't have a lot of good solutions and we the father did some car repair for us. And there have been other times we've had breakdowns and we called the tow truck, but we've seen that happen. And we've seen, uh, we have prayed for a hot water heater and seen the father fix the hot water, you know, heater. You know, you we serve a miraculous God that cares about us. And the things we have to deal with. He's concerned with our stuff. Cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. But I believe I'm going to invite Sister Donna to join the broadcast now and begin to get some of our questions from our listeners tonight. I could just keep going for two more hours. i got so many things in this book that are so worthy of discussion. But I think mm -hmm. I'm going to let our listeners uh, have an opportunity here. So Sister Donna... Uh, come on down and right. we also we're going to be able to get some real <laughs> face time here real soon at the take on the world conference later this month we're really looking forward to that where we'll get a hang out a little bit and we're going to do a midnight ride live at uh, the take on the world conference and you're going to be a part of that and who knows what other uh rascally characters will drag up for that so it'll be exciting looking forward to that here very soon uh here That's in right. just couple of weeks yeah end of august you're going to be in uh, take on the world conference in vermilion ohio i i so humbled to even be able to be a part of it in any capacity and it's an honor to be able to just go there for me i'm i'm more of a fan of all of of this uh kind of topics and some of the speakers that are going to be there and for me it's going to be a huge opportunity to learn a lot as well and be able to connect with so many people out there 
there's an amazing family of people that are tuning in right now and who will watch this later on and they're wonderful people and of course there's some snakes in the grass like always and uh, some wolves in sheep's clothing but of course right they need the, they need sometimes the rod of truth and sometimes the, the the mercy of the father and so i'm really excited for an opportunity to be a part of that and i hope i encourage everybody else to to join in with us as as we do that over the next couple of weeks here and the book will also be launched here this next week people will be able to to get onto the website to find that as well and once again it's snatched from the flames by nathan reynolds you're gonna like it sister donna are you there yes i am fantastic i I did post nate's uh, contact info in the now you see tv chat and i'll send it over to um the youtube in just a few minutes here what do you Um, think about this show tonight pretty good stuff isn't it yes it's wonderful and nate i wish i could be there to give you a hug oh mama donna is so (laughs) proud of you (laughs) Okay, I'm proud of you for your testimony and what you're offering to the world. There needs to be more people like you that speak out and share what's going on. And I know, I know how much courage it takes to do this. So I really can relate to you on that. JD had a question, wanted to know if you were RH negative as well. Nope. Okay. Um, Obadiah's question is from YouTube. What are your thoughts on the RH? There's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, it's a great question. I'm, I was not really like taught anything about that. That wasn't like a big part of my life or my experiences too much. More of what we were taught about had a lot more to do with what like the Illumin bloodlines. Okay, not, <clears throat> remember, Satan and Lucifer are different. Okay, I know that's like not normal for people to hear like, People that worship Lucifer, in their mind, do not worship the devil. They worship the light bearer. They worship Prometheus. They worship Ra, the sun god. They worship all these other Elohim, all these other gods that are that are really Prometheus, right? The one who brought illumination to the world. Whether you think Lucifer is the devil, I don't. I cannot find a verse in the Bible that ever said that. Not once, not twice, not three times, ever. Big so, amen for me on that, brother. And it's really important to understand that because my family was Luciferians in many aspects my grandfather's side were serpent worshipers they were serpent worshipers meaning the travel the dragon that devil that serpent of old revelation 12 is going to give you a clue into his identity the serpent in the garden that's the serpent they're worshiping the fiery serpent the nahash right the seraph right the serpentine class of beings different okay because of that there is different ways that they these people will teach you what's in the blood what it is you need to feed your familiar um certain spirits like different blood certain spirits like fear trauma pain (laughs) drenched into the blood in different um byproducts of the of the thyroid and of the pineal gland and there's all these chemicals our bodies are chemical factories we can create amazing chemicals very quickly and so people drink the blood during these different states of sexual ecstasy, physical pain, emotional joy, great relief, all kinds of different stuff. It's not necessarily that every person out there is looking for RH negative blood. That is a blood class. There's people that maybe are really looking into that or maybe that is its own bloodline. I don't know as much about that. My family was much more interested in illumined bloodlines, people that were serpent seed carriers. They were the they were the seed of, of Nimrod. They carried rebel in them, right? And so my family trace their lineage to the tower, uh, to, to Babel at, in Genesis 9 and 10. You see this Gibberim, this mighty man who was a hunter of the souls of men. He got in God's face and rebelled against him. He hardened himself to God. He was rebellious. That spirit is infectious. It's dangerous. It's alive. And it's rampant today. Right? He's the king over the children of the pit. He is the, the one who was and is not and will be again. Right? That's Apollo, Apollyon, Revelation 19. You need to study him and know your enemy because you're commanded to be not ignorant of the devil's schemes. So I couldn't tell you the specifics of what the RH negative blood stuff is. I don't believe that because you have RH blood negative blood that you are cursed or anything else necessarily. If someone like me who can be a Babylonian moon child can come forth and, and have a new life and a new purpose and a new calling – Man, whether it's by blood or by belief, every person can be brought into the kingdom of God if they choose to set themselves apart to him. 
God made a way for the Gentile, the Jew, and those people that were not of the 12 tribes by blood. Okay, He made a way. There was a mixed multitude wet out of, of Egypt when, they, they, when the angel of the Lord contended with the gods of Egypt and plagued them and showed them who is the most high. Man, he stomped on the head of Leviathan. He cut off the heads of Leviathan and will feed them to the children in the wilderness. Hey, there's a lot happening in the Exodus story that you've got to pay attention to to know why this is important. So I encourage you, please study that. Understand that there is a way that he will walk people out, whether they're already people that are followers of his ways or the people that are the rebels. And I was a rebel who's been redeemed. Praise God. We have uh, about 26 more questions here. Let's so rock it. Let's rock it. Yeah. I on to here. Yeah, um, and I was going to say, too, we are not going to be able to go much beyond midnight all right and, uh, we'll get in as many as we can so please don't be offended if we don't get to your question thank you take that off my back yes thank you <laughs> <laughs> okay um Rhonda wanted to know how can we get a copy of your book great question Rhonda. so the release of the book right that i'm holding here there is only a couple of copies that some people have out there all around us um but these no these copies are not yet available until someday this week. So very soon, we'll just say that. Um, they can go to snatchedfromtheflames.com, snatchedfromtheflames.com. That's a, a, our one website where people can find our former videos that we've been on the shows at, other interviews, my blog, um, where I'm revealing a lot of this stuff. The book will be released there progressively over a timeline, uh, free for people to read. Um, also, chapters are gonna be released on our YouTube channel. People can look for Snatch from the Flames or Nathan and Chelsea Reynolds uh, to find that as well. And people can follow along with us. And we'll release an audio version on, on there progressively as, and a podcast as well uh, over the next week here leading up to the conference and Take on the World. But really, Take on the World is going to be one of the best places for people to, to be able to get their hands on it if they're already coming. If not, it's going to be available through Amazon, through any major bookstore. You can request it brought in. It's going to be distributed, print and shipped directly to you. So even if you're in another country, you should still have access to be able to do that here uh, when the book goes live here in, in just a few days. So it's it's exciting. And for those of you that want it, they can find it there. You'll also just be able to find it on Amazon. Okay. I've already sent the link to YouTube and also in our chat room for that information. Okay. Uh, JD also wanted to know um, how old you were if you don't mind answering that. I don't at all. I'm 68. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay. I'm still kicking. <laughs> all right, Nate. That's okay if you don't want to answer it. Um, there, there's plenty of clues in there in the book, guys. It's not yeah. hard to find right. out, right? You know, <laughs> hey, but... now there's something wrong if I'll admit mine and you won't admit yours. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, 20, I'm 29 years old. Okay. As far as I'm Young, you have to no, be I'm my kidding. Son. Yeah. Okay, uh, don't you think that almost all cults use the threats of cameras or filming to keep the victims silent? I know when we wrote our uh, Egyptian Masonic Satanic Connection book, all the pictures that the children drew that we have in there, there was this little black square in the corner, and they all told us that it was cameras. So whether those cameras had film or not, right? they were threatened. But don't you think that most cults do use that threat? Yeah. Absolutely. And like I said, it's that threat that they will hold over you, that um, compromising video that can pop up at any time. A lot of times, you're right, Donna. A lot of times, it's really like genuinely a camera stuffed on the wall that has nothing in it. Because what they're doing in there, they don't want to be caught on film doing, right? So, But sometimes they will have film footage in there. Sometimes they won't. And you don't know. And so it creates this constant pressure of, are they watching all the time? They're watching me they know what I'm doing. They could at any time, they're going to know what I did. They're going to know what I'm part of. All of that is always there. So there's this constant surveillance state mindset that just creates paranoia that is so crippling and fear of your deepest shame being shown before people, right? And so there's power in speaking the secrets. There's power in telling the truth. There's so much freedom when you speak the truth. And so... Even if that's happened to you, believe me, there's lots of compromising videos of me out there. There is plenty of, there's lots of fire darts in the enemy's toolkit against me. Let's just say that, right? The reason I tell my testimony publicly is so that the enemy, it extinguishes those fiery arrows. I'd rather share and tell everyone my dirty laundry and I'll air it out before all of the world. And they, they want to light me up and burn me. So be it, right? I want to burn for God now. 
I'm, I burned my whole life for the devil and I'm tired of it. And so that's it's important for you to remember, no matter what cult or thing you've been through, even if they did film it, even if they didn't, like there's power and freedom in speaking the truth. That, that should not hold you prisoner any longer. Come out of those rooms of pain. Come out of the, that surveillance mindset and know that God is for you. Who can be against you? There's nothing that can stop you. That's exactly how I felt when I finally got nerve enough to do my testimony publicly because I was considered, as you were, the dark sheep in the family in a lot of ways. And so I was really, it gave me a lot of, of uh, power over the enemy when I was able to just come out and say what really happened. So thank you again for your testimony. Elizabeth wants to know um, the detailed descriptions that you're doing regarding the crimes you committed. Is there any risk of prosecution? Uh, there is no statute of limitations on murder. Yep. There's a lot of risk. Of course. Uh, so there's a lot of risk in speaking the secrets, right? There always will be. Um, you have to decide whether or not it's worth it for another child to go through that torture because you didn't speak the truth. And you're accountable for that. I'm accountable for what I did. Don't get me wrong. And I will be judged for it, right? But I'm willing to go and jump into the court of public opinion. It's a coliseum of chaos, right? It's an orchestrated system of ridiculous mind control. And do I willingly step in there and say, these are the words of my testimony? Absolutely. You know why? Because I believe that I am called to do that. I know that the enemy, that dragon, that serpent of old is defeated by the blood of the lamb, by the words of our testimony Amen. and not loving our lives even unto death. I don't love my life even unto death. I have tasted death. I have felt my heart stop. I have known what it looks like to watch a man die by the hands of my own fingers, wrenching him out of this world. I have seen women become widows at the work of my hands. And I have made children orphans by what I did. And I didn't know any better. And I was a child until I wasn't. And you know what? I'm accountable for that. And yeah, whatever comes from this, I entrust myself to the one who made me, knows me, loves me, cares for me, and will not manipulate me and coerce me to be his slave. I willingly choose to be his servant, to love him, to be in relationship with him. And I trust he will watch my back, that whatever is to come of my life, whether I'm supposed to go into the prison system of perversion, or whether I'm supposed to go wherever, I don't care anymore. My life is not my own but it's for him and I've seen the enemy be defeated by the words of testimony. So I'm gonna speak them until I can't and then I'm gonna rejoice with him in the freedom that I've sought for my entire life. Amen. Amen. Tia wants to know, why do you think the majority of the population disregard the Illuminati and not take them seriously? Because you're conditioned not to believe the truth. Um, the accomplishments and the success of the family um, of the farm, the CIA, and a lot of the underworld agents that, that govern our society, that's one tiny piece of it, right? Lots of other pieces to it, okay? You'll know it's be going to be complete when everything that the mass, mass majority of people believe is a lie, right? That's when you've made effective mind control where people will protect themselves and guard their own slavery. They will fight people that try to set them free, right? They will fight for their masters, and it's very real. And so you can show somebody the truth and everybody out here who's ever tried to share like real truth, like genuine truth to the fullest of their ability with somebody who's totally plugged into that matrix, you realize it. They'll, they'll fight you. They'll hate you. They'll call you crazy. They'll call you part of a cult and they'll think this stuff is crazy and made up and it doesn't matter. And why does that bother? I don't want to look at it. That's gross. All those other things. They've been programmed to think that way from birth. And so it's important to understand every one of us has to walk ourselves out of it to the best of our ability and to be a witness, to share our testimony, to not hide in cowardice, but to be bold and courageous because the righteous are as bold as lions, but the wicked flee when no man chases them. The truth, the secret is that they never want you to know is that they live in fear more than you do, that they are terrified every day of their life. They live waking up, not knowing if this is the day that their kingdom burns this is the day that they feed you to the press. This is the day that your little kingdom that you built on the backs of your children comes crumbling down. 
And let me tell you right now, a lot of kingdoms are about to crumble. And you better believe this, that there is not a lot of sticks that are going to get snatched from those flames unless people repent and speak the secrets and publish their testimonies now before their dark deeds are shown before all of the world. And it's coming. And he said, everything you do in secret, everything you've done in your chambers, read Ezekiel 8, read what Jesus said will come. Everything you've ever done will be that you did in secret will be shouted from the rooftops. What David did in secret, Nathan the prophet came along and exposed to him. And he said, what you did, David, murder, cover up, like having sex with another man and killing him to cover up your crime, that is going to be done in public. And his own son came and had sex, incest, and all this other stuff happened in front of all the world. David, the man after God's heart, had his sins revealed before the world. So all of us are going to. So you better get ready to make that that amends now. Do it now. Don't wait a day. Don't wait 10 minutes. Make a decision now and commit yourself to speaking the truth no matter what it costs you. Amen. Okay, Nate, there's um, people that always do this to me, and I'm just going to throw this in here because they always complain about honoring our parents, that we're supposed to honor our parents, that yeah, we nice. shouldn't tell any secrets. So could you just address that? I believe it's really important for you to do that. Totally. Um, let me ask you the best way you could ever honor your parents is how does God tell you to honor your parents? Okay. How does he tell you to honor him? My first commandment in, if let's be very clear, my first commandment is to love the Lord, my God, with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my strength, with all of my might, and to love my neighbor as myself. That sums up the whole law, the whole instructions, but you got to go read them to know what they say. That's a starting block. And so there is a really easy thing to just say, honor your mother and father and it will go well from you. You have no idea what my mother and father are. You have, Amen. You have no idea what these people, things, spirits are. They are not just a man. Do you understand me? These people are not what you think they are. And so because of that, you know what they want me to do? Shut my mouth. They threatened my daughter. They threatened to destroy every aspect of my life. They took my jobs. They took everything I ever had. You know why? Because it was not my will, but theirs being done in my life. No, no, no. We are supposed to do his will on this earth. I'm, I am accountable to God Almighty. I'm not accountable to the man who raised me or the woman who raised me and raped my soul with what they let happen and orchestrated into my life. I am accountable to obey him. And you know what he says? You speak the truth. Have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose, reprove, and rebuke them. You are not to be a child of the devil. Don't you dare go and put yourself under the yoke of a serpent. That is ungodly. That is not what you're commanded to do. And if it is if it, that is on, my best thing I can do to honor my father is to pray for him and pray that God have mercy on him and deliver him. And I pray for his salvation and that he would come out of this before all of it burns on his own head. Okay. I pray for the people that hurt me and that is miserably challenging to do. And it's not of my strength. I pray forgiveness for these people, but I fight every day, fight to forgive people and I fight to see them set free because I love them still. I care for them. I care for my family members that are still trapped in it. I want them to be free. And for that, I will forsake families and friends. Jesus came to bring a sword. He did not come to bring perfect unity. He came to bring a sword and to set fathers against the mothers, or fathers against sons, mothers against daughters, daughters against mother-in-laws. And that's what he came to do so that we might be part of his kingdom not part of this world amen i couldn't have said it better myself thank you and i uh, just JD want to say real to... briefly uh this is something john and i got into a little bit on our show on the loss of a loved one but you don't want to use the bible against the bible uh we have to honor and love god and when it comes to the place where and we we talked about even when parents are not what they should be. We should honor them as far as we can. But when you can't honor your father and mother and use that as an excuse to dishonor God, you don't want to use Scripture against the Scripture or try to use Scripture against the Father. 
and uh, this just isn't what we want to do. But great it's answer from did. both of you. That is what the devil did. Yeah, it's exactly what he Don't did. Do that. Yeah. You know, yet to this day, Nate, I mean, David knows I've just been experiencing things again because of little things like we'd maybe see something on TV and, um, you know, my mother drugged me and people in my community and my family would not believe that, but she did. And I could probably find proof of it, but what I'm, you know, I have proof because I have an older sister, but anyway, at this point, that's what was always thrown up to us. Well, my sister always says, well, why didn't somebody ask me about all the scars? You mm -hmm. know, you know, why didn't somebody ask? Well, you know, we offered and, and for years I tried to reach out to my parents and I always offered salvation and I really never uh, confronted them in anger. And I finally did confront them face to face when I was 40, but I still didn't get much of an I'm sorry. I think he was sorry they got caught, but not sorry for what they did. Yeah. So you never know how that's going to work. Confrontation's a tricky thing, but I yeah, know that, right that, that question is always thrown up to me. Well, you know, you need to honor your parents. In other words, shut your mouth. Don't talk about the horrible things they did. So I, I knew exactly how you were going to answer that. But anyway, JD says he wants to let you know that his prayers go out to you. It all sounds surreal to him, even though he has a similar background, wow. but People always have a tendency, you know, to disassociate and go into denial is what I would say. So I do understand that, too, when people mm -hmm. just can't take even listening to some of these things. Caesar wants to know, how do we know if somebody's uh, bloodline is from the Illuminati? Um, so part of this, Caesar, I'm going to be honest with you, like the, the word of God is really clear that we don't need to focus as much on useless genealogies is what the scripture says. Um, because there's a huge sect of people, religions, Christian doctrines and dispensations that are so focused on this. A branch of Mormonism is absolutely constantly, you need to study your ancestors, you need to baptize them, you need to have sex with the dead, and all these other things that are done in their rites, because it's birthed out of Freemasonry in a lot of ways, right? I know there's lots of, of Mormons out there who don't know anything about what I just said, but you better study the origins of your faith because it's critically important to understand that. So really to answer answer your question, like it is, it's not something that um, a lot of, sorry, I got distracted here. Somebody said something interesting, but um, there, there's not a necessarily a huge worry that every person out there needs to go be tracing their ancestry by giving their blood and DNA to ancestry.com run by Freemasons and or giving them their uh, DNA to all these people in order to trace that there was heraldry and genealogists and people that do that for for the families and through the bloodlines the reality is most people are going to know it uh, if you're a part of it if you have a last name of one of the bloodlines there's lots of different lists out there some of them are accurate some of them are not um, your family will be able to prove be proofed prove their bloodline and lineage to the 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 blue bloods to the rulers and the gods of old and most people can't do that. Most normal people can't do that. But there's lots of other families and people and organizations that do do that. I don't necessarily recommend that. If you need to do that, some people I understand do. There's be cautious and intentional about how you go about doing that, who you use as a resource to find that stuff out. It's not always the best idea. So for what it's worth. I, I want to say one thing real quick about that because this is, uh, and I haven't said much the whole show, but um, good luck getting – that information out of ancestry anyway uh freemasons right. and, and families of freemasons are very secretive about their genealogies yeah. and usually the only time you're going to find that stuff out is if they have a genealogist or they keep their own genealogy oh, so yeah yeah and you're and nathan's right definitely do not give your dna on that if you already have then whatever but don't do it because it. if you read, it. if you read about it it says that they have the right to sell it to third parties or do anything they want with it and um, that's scary. Anyways, yeah. Yeah. just a couple real quick things here. Ephesians 6 and 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. In the Lord. Very important. Now, mm -hmm. also, I want to say, too, there are people out there that try to make people think there's something special by claiming to be a part of the Despacini. And the short truncated version of that is that's a bunch of baloney. So. Yeah. Okay. 
Tia wants to know, how did you come to Torah knowledge? Uh, that's a whole, whole huge, nice, awesome story. That's in the book, right? Obviously, it's a big oh, okay. That's good. But they also, there was previous episodes that I was on the Midnight Ride that she can check out on our website and see uh, where I answer that question for about two hours. Right. So uh, it's a big, awesome, long question. And I believe that's the fourth generation secret program. And the Redemption Code of the King was the first show I was uh, episode I did with you guys. And then who is Israel? Understanding a lot of this kind of stuff was was important there. So I talk about it there and you can check that out for a, a more in-depth version. OK, question from YouTube from Diane. Does MS-13 supply children to the elite? Uh Lots of cartels supply lots of human beings to the elite. Um, yeah, there's a great network running from south to north. And uh, I-25 is a wonderful corridor for that. Okay. Um, Wellspring from YouTube wants to know, uh, what do you know about Eastern Star and Rainbow Girls? Uh, a lot less than anybody else out there. Well, we happen to know a lot about that. And if you would go to our YouTube channel, we actually have a playlist on masonry. And I had a guest on named Laura Brown, who's an expert in that area. So I'll try to post that in the chat room since that question has come up. But anyway, uh, we do have that information. And they are the uh, wives usually and daughters of masons. But you can also be adopted into those groups. And of course... It's a cult, and it's a sex cult Yeah. Um, to be distinct about Freemasonry. Okay, Caesar's next question. Real quickly. Uh, um, how do we know? Kat if Donna? Someone... Yes. Well, I just want to say real quickly on that, um, Kathy Burns' book on the Eastern Star is the best ever written, and uh, Kathy does quote us in there many times. I love her book on the Eastern Star, and also this same concept applies of finder groups and finder organizations that you know these are not safe places they're not safe places for young ladies so go ahead okay um caesar's question is how do we know if someone is from the illuminati or works for them and is pretending to be a friend or christian mm, by their fruits you shall know them right you need to study the word and ask for discernment is very, very, very important to understand because uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing is a very real thing that's described in the scriptures. And there's lots of wolves in our shepherding folds out there and they look so good and they play the part so well. But you pay attention by their fruits, you'll know them. You'll know a wolf when they come forth and speak what it is they really believe in this new apostolic reformation that came infectingly birthed out of the church in the last few years and throw away the Old Testament's Mr. Stanley made a wonderful uh, statement on his three-part series about destroying the Old Testament. There's a, there's a man who is a wolf in sheep's clothing, okay? I don't know if he's part of the Illuminati or whatever else, but I'll tell you this. He's complicit with the devil by saying that kind of stuff. You don't ever, you don't, don't add to or take away from his word. It's very real and important. And so guard yourself against learning the ways of the world without learning the ways of Yahweh. So it's important that in all this topic, you study the word of God so that you can know what are the fruits of wolves in sheep's clothing? What are the fruits of the leavens of the Pharisees? What are the fruits of the children of Belial? What are the fruits of Lucifer? What are the five I wills and the sigils that mark them? It's important to study your enemies. It's also important that you know his God's way way better than you know the enemy. So study your word, get to know him, and you'll be able to spot a counterfeit when they walk into your midst because your spirit will testify that man, that woman knows not my ways, but they know the ways of this world. So learn how to test fruit, be a better fruit inspector than you are someone who knows about a lot of fringe topics. Okay. Katie wanted to know um, if you remembered everything or just parts of your past. Well, it's definitely like the whole book kind of chronicles how, how a lot of this came and how to survive it. No, Katie, you cannot get a full download of your entire life and all this bondage and darkness all at once. It will kill you. There's a reason to split, right? Like one episode of this trauma is so severe you had to split your soul to survive. Okay, so if that happens systemically over and over and over and over and over again, you can't get it all back at once. It will kill you. Like it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll die, but 
it can kill every other area of your life so fast and you will be so destabilized that it overwhelms you. But if you work with the power of the living God and his Holy Spirit and you cling to his word and his identity that he is true, he is the spirit of truth, he will not lie to you, he will not coerce you, he will not destroy you, he will bring it back to you in as much as you are able to manage in order to get healed and not be further traumatized. And so there's a very fine line with that. And survivors have different aptitudes and abilities to be able to endure different amounts of that coming back, getting cleansed, restored, redeemed, and a new purpose and new identity and wholeness being brought into your life. Some people are able to do that a little faster. Some are a little slower, but God works individually with each of us to do that. So mine came in a very highly concentrated window because I've always, I've had a bigger capacity than most to function at a much higher level. And so I went through a very in-depth, all, all no holds barred, 18 hours of day, bleeding your soul out onto the page for many, many years um, to do that. But I, for the most part, have a highly concentrated grasp and understanding of the majority of what, what happened, what I was a part of, and what I really need to know in order to be set free. I don't need to know everything. You know what I mean? And that's exactly what we caution people whenever we minister to them. We always tell them that we all need to pray and ask God to help them to remember what they need to remember to get well. Because you do not have to remember everything to get well. Because sometimes those things that you don't remember is exactly why you shouldn't remember them, that God wants to keep them in the past. But I, I believe that um, that is the more important thing there too. Um, let's see. Uh, next question is, um, are you a targeted individual now that you've come out and are declosing this info? Yes and no, right? Uh, when I first came out, yeah, lots, lots of targeting, uh, gang stalking, a lot of the intimidation tactics. That actually was more so involved a corporation, um, big money in big business. They do crazy stuff to protect that. And so you get involved in the judicial system or like whistleblower, whistleblower programs or any of the witness protection programs out there, and you become a target like you can't imagine. So, yes, I've been through the dredges of that. My wife and I have many times um, been enduring that, but, uh, there was a lot of freedom that came when I started learning authority, spiritual authority, learning that there's a lot of this stuff is operating off of a spiritual realm, including technological, including physical, but it's a lot of spiritual aspects of it. So really, it's really important to learn how to take authority over that stuff. And that's detailed, uh, pretty systemically in the book as well. If you had to estimate the number of chosen ones, how many do you think there are? Millions. Millions. Okay, thank you. Um, JD also wanted to know, have you ever uh, been a trip seat, a um, Montclair CIA remote viewing you mentioned? Uh, yeah, I've been in the chairs. Right. Okay. Um, how, ha how do they choose between who they will use to program versus those they use and kill for sacrifice um, uh, the, you mentioned earlier they saw your question, okay. like um, ask a madman that right uh, ask a ask, ask a psychopath how he chooses his targets okay? well you mentioned earlier they saw your strengths yeah I some, people, they, some people they think oh I'd rather recruit this dog instead of eating him yeah all right it's a okay. very gross thing to think of people like cattle, right? But it's very real. And they look at you as a piece of meat. And some pieces of meat are very, very tasty and delicious, and they're consumed once. Some pieces of meat are consumed for lifetimes. And I was chosen to be consumed over lifetimes. Well, and also somebody's pointing out that we didn't answer the question because we asked the percentage, but uh, millions, if you figure out how many people are there on the earth today, what six hundred million? I have no, well, percentage-wise, I don't know. My my, here's the thing: chosen ones, uh, like I alluded to, and a lot of what I detail in the book, chosen ones that I'm describing. Right, this is ch mostly uh, North American and European, Western European. Um, there's a whole other segment of these things that got into places like Australia and everywhere those Nazi infections broke out. This broke out and multi generations started back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, ongoing, the next generation. We're at the fifth and sixth now, just from that aspect of it. Other aspects of it, lots of other chosen ones from lots of other families that have been doing this for thousands of years. 
So I can only speak to my experiences and some of the information and groups that I was a part of and groups and teams I led. There were millions that I was aware of here in our country and some online, some offline assets, some that were very ready to go, some that were very old and used up. Um, that's a horrible thing to say in a lot of ways, but that's their perspective on it. And so there's lots of people out there that are unfortunately a lot of those programming breaks down at key moments in your life. 27, 26, 28 kind of time frame is a big one. Another one happens midlife crisis kind of time frames, and then much later in your life and when you're wanting to leave a legacy. These are kind of pivotal moments where someone can choose to break out of it and or choose to keep into it or press their children into it. Okay, Starla wanted to know, did they do anything to the DNA of the super soldiers like you? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Of course. Um, okay. Michigan mom wants to know, uh, what is the percentage in the U.S. of the secret society? Are they in every city? Well, so let me let me ask every person who ever watches this, go out to your city sign, the entrance to your city, town, village, whatever, and see who are the founding members, who are the uh, pillars of your society, pillars of your town, who built your judicial courthouse. Go in, you're going to see Masonic, Freemason, cultic, Temple of Set. You're going to see the friends of the church and the Temple of Satan. You're going to see all these occult groups hiding in plain sight, greeting you as they walk into their city and say, this city's builders and architects are the followers of the devil right in front of your face. And they get a power from you knowing that and not knowing that and being choosing to willingly engage in that system and choosing to be a civilized man rather than a set apart man and partake in their system. Okay. Go, you go learn. It's in time for people to study their enemy, study his signs and symbols and understand what they mean because they mark their territory. They are territorial spirits. There's spiritual powers, rulers, and wickedness in high places. There are thrones. There's dominions. There's a hierarchy of principalities, cherubs, seraphim, ophanim. There is all these hierarchies. Each group might worship different entities. Okay, Need to learn that. It's important to understand that. So when you go to your town, I don't know where you live. You do. Go find it for yourself. Is it a temple of uh, Freemasonry? That's the cornerstone of your church, your town. Is it a Catholic temple, which was built on the ruins of a blood drinking Satanist cult from the 1840s? Probably. The, the Catholics love building their, their temples on graveyards and piles of children bones and crazy Mayan altars. It's unreal. Go, go learn and study it for yourself, right? I'm not going to give you like a per percentage because I can't possibly know that. They're all kind of like hidden in plain sight, right? Oh. Um, people are asking, can they pre-order your book? And we told when it was going to come out and it's going to be available at the uh, Take Back the World conference in Ohio. It'll, it'll be available. It will not be pre -order. Well, by the time people are, most people are watching this, yeah, they'll be able to go to my website and just buy it. Um, there's a intentional timeline for a release. Uh, so I can't, I'm not going to mess with that. Nobody can mess with that. Uh, but yes, it'll come out very shortly. I do not believe you can pre-order it. Uh, my understanding is that you cannot yet. Potentially, it's already live. I don't know. I, I uh, was not ready for our, our uh, meeting to be tonight. However, it's it's working out great. So uh, by the time most people watch this, they DMI, should be able to go DMI. on the website and be able to buy it. Um, but I do not believe there's a pre-order available until um, probably Tuesday or Wednesday uh, this week. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tia wants to know, how did you regain your, regain your identity after it was so split? Uh, very long, arduous battle, but first of all, learning whose identity you were and whose you weren't, what your real purpose was versus what they told you it was, is, is a process. It's a lot more detailed in the chapter called Inner Worlds and uh, the Dodge Viper, which walks people through what that looks like. And so those will be released here as well with it. And um, I can't articulate that in two minutes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We have just a few more questions. We might even better get through them all. Uh, what's the most important thing you would like for spouses of people with a past like yours need to remember or say? Have uh, compassion. Have compassion. I, I, I didn't know compassion was a thing, right? I didn't know that that was a possibility for the likes of me. Um, my wife still loved me. She chose to still love me. She was, she was heartbroken. She was furious. She was miserable. She was angry. You know, you guys talked about this when we had her on the show, you know, on Married to a Multiple, I think was the title of that show. And uh, she tells her story there. And I encourage people to go and see her advice because she, she can speak it best, you know. Um, but, but she loved me. 
and and I'd never felt, I'd never really known unconditional love until I met that woman, until she chose to love me even after I told her this, even after I told her about the blade, even after I told her about the brothers and all the rest. She's, she still loves me. That That heals me. That heals me when she lets parts of my soul come up and speak the secrets and speak these horrible things, and she still chooses to love me. That's healing. That's power. Okay, we just have a just about three more questions, so I think we can safely answer those. Um, but there is a personal one here, and you can choose to answer or not answer, Nate. Um, they want to know how many broken parts did you have, did you identify, and how long did it take you to completely heal of all your broken parts? You can choose not to answer that if you don't want to. So, so I'll put it like this. Let's get real. <clears throat> you cannot, You cannot understand this unless... Someone asking this question knows a lot more than they're alluding to, right? Putting back together the pieces of a systemically shattered mind takes a long time. <clears throat> it's not something that just can happen overnight. However, I was a complex case, right? Complex polyfragmented is the nice uh, te DID textbook term for it, okay? Uh, a lot more than two, three, four, five main, main functioning parts, right? Lots of pieces. But, but core, yes, I know the amount, and huge amounts of that were reintegrated over time. Parts of that still chose to dissociate during stress. Long process, lots of lots of topic for another time. That's the key word there, and we've ministered to several people that have had personalities, and it's a process, but I am saying what we say in our book, that God can fix whatever the enemy split, and we firmly believe that even though it is a process sometimes it takes longer for some people than it does others but it is possible because we have seen several survivors become every whit whole yeah. which is what the lord would have in his perfect plan yeah. uh, what um tia wants to know what concerns or preventative measures do you take to keep your child safe from what happened to you a lot of that i'm not going to discuss here um fine but I sever communication um, and access to her, right? Don't let a monster touch your child. I don't care how good they look. I don't care how nice they are. I don't care that they may have been a good dad at one point until they're not. And uh, don't do that, right? Uh, if there's even a hint of an iota of a possibility that a family member of yours, an uncle or a cousin at a family reunion, might get your child away for a few minutes, you're accountable for that. Guard your children. Guard them. Protect them. Don't let them go over to Cousin Johnny's for the night where uh, Uncle Bill's going to be there and uh, hang out. And uh, you did not guard your child. You are accountable for that. Don't let your children be handed off to people that you don't. Don't let other people raise your children. Start there. Do whatever it takes to not let other people raise your children. Fight for your children. Protect them. Defend them. Be willing to sacrifice for them. Fight for the ways of God rather than the ways of this world. Find a different path, and it's found in his word. It's outlined in his scriptures, and he will tell you how to come out of it and be set apart unto him, and he will protect you. Thank you, Nate. And I'll never, ever regret protecting my children. And they realized that as the older they grew, the more they understood that better. But yeah. Uh, I did write a small article about how to protect your child, and it's just um it's not a safe touch type article. It's just a yeah. little bit of a, some tips on preventive measures that might help people. It's on our website, How to Protect a Child. And Nate is so right. Raise your own children. The Bible tells us, train up your child in the way they should go. That's what we need to be concerned. They will not depart from it. Yeah, and they'll not depart from it. Amen. Uh -huh. Um. Starla's question is, did you come out at 27 years old like so many other MK Ultra and SRA victims? Uh, more or less, yeah. That's the long and short of it. Okay. And I have just one. I'm going to say this again. Sorry. I wasn't out then, right? I began really completely doing whatever it takes to completely come out of it then. Okay. Different, mm -hmm. but true, right? Yeah, I think maybe she was trying to establish that. Yeah, lots of people, it's a window. It's a very critical I, window. That is a critical window, but also I've seen people that are 80 years old yes. contact us that's never talked to anybody. Yeah. So yeah. it's a, it depends on the person. Yeah. And the last question is from me. 
and you may not know the answer right now. Do you plan to minister to others on a personal level or mostly by your book and testimony and videos? Of course, you would need to be sure that your wife is in one accord with your decision. Absolutely. So people will start asking you that and you'll... Great question. Um, I'm really not able to minister on an individual basis in almost all circumstances. Um, my primary calling is this, is to share the words of my testimony. I have worked very, very hard for very long to see this come forth, okay? Um, the, it is a dismantling book. People pay attention. There is a very intentional code written into that aspects of the Word of God, uh, if you will, that tells us how to get free from the ways of this world, okay? God calls us out of bondage into freedom. That's the whole story of his people over and over again from beginning to end. It happens over and over again. People rebel. People follow the ways of the world. They get enslaved. They cry out in their bondage. He delivers them. He sets them free. He brings them out of it, teaches them a new way, and over time, they can forget him and fall into those patterns again, and it restarts that cycle. So every one of us is susceptible to that. Every one of us has that stuff going on in our life. My calling is not to do individual counseling as I once did. I did 10 years of mental health work um, and doing a lot of individual counseling, and it's something I still am passionate about. It's something I do at times. It's what I was trained in in a lot of ways. However, that's much less possible for a lot of the, uh, the work that I'm now doing in a much more public um, platform and, and what it is I'm here for. So no, not really. And that's what my wife and I's primary calling right now is to be able to bring this forth. That may change over time as circumstances in our life change, but that's right now is not really our calling at this point. But I love hearing from people. I pray for them. I do my best to try to, uh, to encourage them in any way I can. But I'm not really capable of walking someone through that entire process. There are people that are out there that do that. They're really important, and we need more of them. We need more of them who love God with all their hearts, who obey him, and who are, who are anointed to help set people free. Okay, that's it for the questions. All right. All right. Snatch from the flames, everybody. Nathan Reynolds, you're going to love it, and you're going to be blessed by it. I guarantee it. And it's time for me to say my thank yous to Sister Donna for taking the questions, and uh, thanks to John Pounders for co-hosting as always. And a big thank you to Nathan Reynolds and all of his family and all that he does. And also a big thank you to all of you our Midnight Ride listeners. You are the best. So, high five, everybody. High we'll five. see you next Saturday night. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up.